This is part two then of a series where I'm fitting this iNav flight controller, the Matek F411WSE, into this Sky Hunter racing model. There is a playlist available that'll be linked up there for you. In the first part, I just covered the basic idea and the components that I was going to be using. In this second video, I'll be moving on. You can see that I've attached the battery connector to the board and also the speed controller. To affect that, what I did was to cut back the heat shrink sleeving on the original speed controller and I removed the connector which was on it for powering the camera as we're going to be powering that from the filtered voltage supplied by the flight controller so that's been removed and I also removed the standard servo connector. All that we need from the speed controller now is the signal wire and the power. Previously when we were just using a receiver we were using the BEC or the regulator on the speed controller but now that function is being provided by the flight controller. Let's take a closer look at the connections here. On the bottom right here you can see the battery connectors and this by the way was the battery connector that I removed from the speed controller. I attached these new wires to that. And for the speed controller we have obviously the positive and negative and the signal wire which is going to the pad S1. In the first video we saw how in the iNav configurator there was a setup for this model already which removed the S2, the second motor, as we shall not be needing it. With those parts in place then let's move on to the connections for the SBUS receiver. Here we can see then my FR Sky XSR receiver. Chose this one because it has the smart port functionality. The connections you can see on the board clearly. SBUS CPPM S port plus five and ground. I've taken the precaution of removing the wire from the CPPM port as we're not going to be using that and that's confusing enough already without extra wires hanging around. On the top part of the flight controller module then from the left here we can see ground plus 4.5 volts S bus and transmit pin 2 is where the smart port is connected. Quite straightforward there. Let's move across now and take a look in the iNav configurator and make sure that our receiver is recognized correctly. Just going to connect my flight controller up. Hear it recognized there. Go and connect. All looks good. Let's move on down to the receiver tab. In here, by default, I think it's set for serial, so we're we're good. And the provider. I think defaults to spec 1024. So in my case, I'm just going to select the S bus there. Uh, we don't have to worry about the serial port inversion. Let's turn on my transmitter now. Welcome to OpenTX. Throttle the And we can see I am actually moving the aileron control elevator rudder, though we don't actually have one. And throttle active the throttle. I don't have a flight battery attached and of course I have removed the propeller. Everything appears to be good in there. One thing to be aware of is the channel map of course. There is a pull down for various defaults and you can actually type in the box here. Make sure that that matches your receiver setting. And once you've done that, save and reboot. I've already done that process. I think uh, at this point it will be useful to test that the speed controller is working as well. Back up to outputs. And here we can see the motor control. We need to check this box here. And at the moment I don't have a flight battery. Let's connect one up. 
Now the throttle actually on the transmitter is not going to work because we're not armed yet. The flight controller would need a GPS signal and other goodness, but we can test it using the master control here for the motor, as I said, on S1. Well, clearly you, you can hear that that is all working fine. The next thing to do then will be to move on and to connect up the individual servo controls. Taking a quick look then in the outputs in iNav just to confirm what the servo outputs are and they are 3, 4 and 5 for the elevator and the two ailerons there being no rudder. It's a little confusing to see 2, 3 and 4 here but it confirms here that we're looking at S3, 4 and 5 as our physical outputs. If we then look at the documentation we can see that on the lower board we have the S3, 4, 5 and 6 connections for the servo. Now this is a very good example of why using a dedicated airplane flight controller is to your advantage because the servo layout is very simple. If you used a flight controller, just a standard F4, then perhaps you would only have the signal outputs and not the voltage and ground. So we can put a header in here, which is supplied, connect our normal servo plugs directly to these headers. There is also a cutout in the upper board to enable you to do that. Looking at the board in reality then, we can see the pins laid out across here, and this is the supplied header, which we simply need to solder into place there, and then we can attach and test our servos. I'm ready now then to test the servo outputs, having soldered in the header. I'm connected at the moment to S3, which is the elevator. Here in iNav, looking at the receiver, if I move the elevator, we can see that that part is good. But what I've also had to do is to set up, in my case, I've chosen channel 5 to be the modes switch. If I activate that now, we can see channel 5 moving through the three positions. Down in the modes tab, I've only set up the single mode for manual here, as we can see on channel 5. So at the moment it's inactive. If I move the switch up, we can see it changing to blue. Now it's in its manual mode. So far, so good. Taking a look at the board itself now, we can see from my receiver, the green light, that's bound to my transmitter. So that is all good. I've just attached a test servo, as I said, to S3, the elevator, but nothing's going to happen at the moment because we don't have any main power. Let's connect that up. And now, as I move the elevator, we can see the servo move. That's excellent news. Let me move the servo onto one of the ailerons. So there we have the aileron channel working. And finally, on to S5 down here, which will be the opposite aileron. In principle, then, all our servo outputs are working. We can worry about the directions and other things once I've got the controller fixed into the model. After the servos, then, I'll turn my attention to the GPS module. I'm using the popular Betian BS880. The individual pins for the compass and the GPS are labelled on there, and we can see them here in front of the receiver connections. We have then ground, SCL, SDA, transmit one, receive one, and plus five volts. The important thing to remember here is to swap over the receive and transmit Therefore, what is labelled as receive on the GPS goes to transmit and vice versa. With that in place, then let's power the thing up and connect iNav and check that it's working. Before launching iNav, let's connect the main power battery and that will provide the 5 volts to the GPS module. We can see the transmit LED flashing away there and of course 
in reality it will be mounted this way up, that being the antenna. Connecting into iNav, the first thing to note is that the GPS indication has gone blue. That tells us that iNav is communicating correctly with the module. Remembering that back in the ports we had that set up, as we can see on UART1, and also in the configuration here under GPS that we've got this switched on, we can leave that as uBlocks. We don't need to worry about ground assistance. We'll use Galileo satellites. We'll take a look at that because I'm in Europe and it gives us the option to use those satellites. To do that then we need to go down into the CLI and just check using get Gali Galileo and at the moment it's switched off by default. I copy that then and say set equals on. Galileo is now set to on so we need to save that. Save and reboot. Now we can go back into the configuration. We can see that it's automatically enabled that to you to use the Galileo satellites for Europe. Nothing else to change in there. Looking down in the GPS tab, clearly I'm in doors and there won't be any ability to fix on the satellite, but at least it's telling me that it's receiving messages and there are no errors. That then is the basic GPS configuration. The last two things to connect to the board then will be the camera and the video transmitter. For the camera, all that I need, power and ground, and the video signal itself, so just the three connections there. Remembering that on the flight controller, the power is actually VBAT, the battery voltage. Don't get caught out like some people have, connecting a camera that cannot cope with the battery voltage and letting the magic smoke out. A similar piece of screened cable is required there. Similarly for the VTX, the transmitter, what I'm going to need obviously is power and again this is going to be VBAT, not a problem for this guy. But in addition to the video out, we've also got the green cable here which is the smart audio to control the power output and other parameters on the transmitter which means I'm going to need four wires. Fortunately being the consummate pack rat I found in my box of bits this which is out of a surround sound home theater type thing and what do I see here? On this end we've got a nice screen cable which will be perfect for the camera and here on the other side a four-way cable and screen which would be perfect for the VTX and the length is correct as well. I'm not exactly sure where I'm going to be placing these components but using a screen cable that's long enough to go the length of the plane will make life easier. Let me get those wires cut off of here and soldered on to their respective components then we can come back and check that everything is working. Time then to test the fruits of our labours. Note that I have the video transmitter sitting on a fan. This guy gets plenty warm even at its lowest power setting. I don't want to, to damage that. Clearly we have that camera layout there. Google should be recording now. Let's supply our main power. Okay, so in principle things are working. As we can see on my FPV goggles, we have the, the camera. Transmitter is obviously working. Having proven that things are in principle working, there are a couple of things that I need to check back over in iNav. Let's go over and do that. In iNav then, if you remember when we connected the receiver, the smart port connection was going to soft serial 2, in which case we need to enable the telemetry function and put that as smart port. The last thing that we did was to connect the VTX 
and that uses the smart audio function on soft serial one, in which case we go across to peripherals and select that as TBS smart audio. With those two set up now, save and reboot. Now I can go back and check those functions using my transmitter. Now we can test out the smart audio function. Power everything up. It's a little difficult to see. Let me put the lens cap on. That's better. Now we can clearly see the OSD display. Now to get into the smart port functionality, we have to move the throttle up and yaw and then pitch up. Well, that's not going to work because the throttle is disabled. Throttle active. Let's try that again. So throttle yawed and I'm not sure which way that goes, pitch up, I think. So now we can see we can switch through the various options. For example, if we want to go down to features, we can see all the options there. Let's look at the VTX. It's currently in pit mode, so we can see at the top of the screen 25, meaning 25 milliwatts. And at the top again, we can see the, the channel frequency. So we can change those things with the band and the channel in there if we wish and set the power output that we want. For example, 200, 500, 800. Leave that at 25. Confirm, yes, and then back. Clearly, I'm not going to go through all of those options, but you can see clearly that the smart port functionality is working. We've gone then from a uh, pile of components to uh, a working system. There is just one thing I wanted to check before going back into iNav. Just bear with me a minute. Just to wrap up this video then, one thing I forgot to do after I configured the GPS, we can see working up there, was to set up the magnetometer or compass. Let's go down then into configuration, and we have in sensors here the magnetometer currently switched off, or none. We'll put that to auto, and save and reboot. And when iNav reloads, we now can see our compass. That then wraps it up for this particular video. In the next video, I'm going to be looking at how to fit all of these bits and pieces into the aircraft. Thanks for watching.